25 years, almost coming to an end. Uh, first of all, uh, how did you get involved in the ATSIS unit? By accident. <laughs> uh, the short version is that I unexpectedly came back from my first academic position in Western Australia to Queensland, having done my first two degrees here. Um, wife's mother got sick, so we came back from there, and I had no job, so I was doing some archaeological consulting work. And the then director of the unit, Michael Williams, who I've known pretty much all my life, um, offered me a, what was then a part-time short-term job and that we, we managed to turn into a, a full-time job within 18 months. So, yeah. What I didn't know is that he'd assured the university that I would bring in enough money to pay for myself. <laughs> uh, in those days too, uh, was there an importance on teachings of Aboriginal culture, Aboriginal studies? That was the whole point. Um, up until that time, um, there were three what were then called interdisciplinary subjects because the unit still isn't allowed to own its own academic subjects because we're not an academic part of the university, we're part of the central admin. Um, and one, they all belong to social work from memory. One had never been taught and the other two were taught um, by people in the, in the unit, Michael and others, Aboriginal people. He was concerned though that people could actually graduate with a major in Aboriginal studies without having any real experience of interacting with Aboriginal people. Because um, the unit in those days was very small, the student numbers were very small. Um, and so uh, he asked me to come on board, and when, when the job became full time, to set up a, a major in Aboriginal studies that was mainly taught or entirely taught out of the unit and mostly by Aboriginal people because until then, apart from the couple of subjects that were taught from the unit, all of the other subjects in the Aboriginal Studies major were mainstream subjects. Um, and so that was my first job, was to create what was then a double major, in fact. Um, the double bit, the second half of the double was, was still the other outside subjects, but we built up from two to 12 subjects. And just touching on that point of it the unit not owning its own courses, mm. should that happen down the track with them? Well, what? probably legally we can't because of the way universities work and because we're part of the admin structure, not the academic structure, yeah, we'd have to become, we, yes, certainly, if we became part of the academic structure, mm. um, uh, or at least the teaching part of us became part of the academic structure, mm. it wouldn't be a problem at all. In your travels, have you seen that sort of set up though? With, uh, Absolutely, and in fact, um, a lot of the other, all the units around Australia, all the universities around Australia have to have something like this unit. Everybody does it differently. Um, some don't really have academic programs, some do have academic programs, some have the academic programs and the support programs completely separate. Some have them in the same outfit like us, varies around, and around the country. Bear in mind that there aren't just Indigenous people in Australia, there's Indigenous people all over the world and you see exactly the same things in uh, all the other parts of the world where this, this uh, occurs. Um, also in your travels, uh, what about the representing ATSIS unit, how, how has that been important for you? Um, it's become p p part of my personal brand, so to speak, mm. um, and it, it's done well, it took, as I said in my, my retirement letter to, to um, the PVC, Bronwyn, it took my career in, in directions that I would never have imagined mm. um, to deal with stuff uh, up to and including sort of UN and, and World Heritage, UNESCO uh, World Heritage, which I wouldn't have had on my radar when I was, you know, first starting out. Um, and in all of that time, it's been to my great pleasure as well as to my advantage if you like to be part of the unit and advertise myself as part of the unit and sort of wear unit shirts and so on when I'm traveling rather than part of the rest of the university so to speak certainly not part of where I would normally be from my academic background with the archaeologists um, uh, because it, it sort of gave my my work in the area um, much more credibility that I was working in an Aboriginal organisation, part of the university, so rather than uh, out in the faculties. How has the course structure been changed over the 25 years that you've seen and also what the students want? The course structure? Or course, course structures, you know, so um, um, the actual... Not, not a lot really, I mean what we're teaching, we're not 
some of the subjects are have, there's a long bureaucratic history to this. Some of the subjects are the same. A handful of them are the same that we've taught all the way along, and they're the basic introductory subjects. Um, I was very concerned that we introduce a Torres Strait specific subject, and for a long time, we were the only people that did that in you know, the whole of Australia. Um, which I was very proud of. So in terms of the content, that's changed. The overall structure hasn't really um, changed except that in one review or another somewhere they chopped off all the subjects, and it wasn't only us that got chopped, chopped off all the subjects in the major that weren't taught by the unit, which I didn't see as necessarily a bad thing at all. Um, and so we've changed some of the topics and added and subtracted, but otherwise it's the majors pretty much stayed the same in that it's it's about giving uh, everybody, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island students, but more particularly all the other students in the university, the opportunity to learn about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people, primarily from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people. Mm. Does it surprise you a lot of overseas students want to learn that? No, not at all. Um, what surprises me is that they have to come to Australia to, usually from countries which have their own Indigenous populations, mm to engage with Indigenous issues and it sometimes it makes, makes me really cross <laughs> where they they come and it's as if there are no I don't know native Canadians or native Japanese or you know because there are non-Japanese people in Japan who were there before the people became the Japanese arrived um, and it, it sort of in some ways it really annoys me that they they sort of don't have anything to do with people largely in the same sort of social and political circumstances back home and they come here to immerse themselves in, in the magic of Aboriginal experience. And then I think, well, better than nothing. They get it here, maybe when they go home, they will then choose to engage with with people uh, in their own countries. And so, you know, I'm, I'm more happy than, <laughs> than not about that. So, yeah. Over the many years, was it hard to find lecturers? Absolutely. Um, and and we've had constant trouble it's a it's a sort of horrible cycle in that uh we can't get aboriginal for a long time there were very very few aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people at any university anyway and the GO8 universities in particular and that's still the case but we got caught in the rules of well you can't teach unless you're qualified but you can't get qualified because there's no teachers um and so we had arguments with the university on and off over the years to get qualified uh, Aboriginal people who were qualified in the community sense in terms of their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge and life experience not necessarily qualified with a PhD or a Masters or even an undergraduate degree. So originally for example the Torres Strait subject was taught by people largely from the community with me or somebody else in the background doing the bureaucratic stuff um, and I think that worked well and, and it, in, this is not this is the simple version. Uh, the university in some ways has caught up to us now by sort of saying, well, we understand what the, the important things are and we don't necessarily require uh, PhDs or any necessary academic qualification to, for our academic uh, Aboriginal staff. So they were trying to tick a box, you mean? The university was ticking a box in that sense? Um, not so much ticking a box, is that they just couldn't get their head around the fact that, that there was a different you know, mm. way of doing this. And, and as I said, 25 years is a, is, has seen quite a bit of shift in, in things here, um, uh, in, in attitudes uh, to, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people actually being at the university as students, let alone as staff. And there are probably still a few people around who have difficulty with that, but but we've seen a lot of change in that regard and, and a, a, a willingness, if you like, for the university to come to the party. And I must say, it's not these sorts of bureaucratic things are not just in the way of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people, they're in the way of all sorts of other people uh, all the time, but quite often it's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people who've pushed the, the envelope to get it changed for everybody. Yeah. The access unit, how has that changed over 25 years for you? <laughs> it's much bigger. Um, when I started, there was a handful of us and everybody did everything. So the academics, um, without going into too much gory detail, when I, for the first long period that I was here, uh, the academics did everything. So the academics did all the student support that's now done by dedicated staff and all the academic advising, which is now done by dedicated staff and you know, all the other things that are now done in the unit, your job even, that's done in the unit by 
a special person was done by a handful of us who also did all the academic work. Yeah. Uh, highlight for you over the last 25 years, first of all, academically, in, in your own academic work. Um, without sort of blowing my trumpet, having this unit through work that I and other people have done, recognised as a place of excellence and expertise in uh, globally in in what we might call indigenous studies to take in the global dimension of it but certainly in Australia in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island studies and we've got a good reputation and now uh, you know a generation you know, 25 years is a generation a generation after I started we've got a reasonable number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island higher degree students we've got Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people with PhDs we've got lots more students than we have used to have um, you know that has been a, a dramatic kind of change and and uh, I said to someone recently and my job when I got here was to work myself out of a job and a bit rudely they said you know 25 years you know <laughs> you've done a great job on that I said well it's actually it's a generational change and we're abs not just because of me but because of the work of people in this unit and the university coming along with us and giving us tremendous support um, at, at most levels most of the time um, we've, we've, I think we've come a very very long way I mean this is a horrible thing to, to say but when I first arrived here we had senior people uh, in the university who would tell us to our faces that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people didn't really belong at the university mm. and now we've got well, several hundred students you know, growing numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island staff we've come a long way yeah, I was going to touch on that too. I mean, we got the Reconciliation Action Plan launched in December. Mm. So over this 25 years, uh, the university has come along for the ride mm. only when it suits them? Not so much. I mean, the, we had one of the... Before it became the unit, we had, through the, the actions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people themselves and what you might call them sympathetic people mm. in the administration as well as academically, um, we've had a, a presence of Aboriginal people here at the university for a very long time. And when I was an undergraduate here in the 70s, which was a pretty interesting time <laughs> to be on campus, there was a very high profile Aboriginal presence here, um, which I kind of look back and, and miss quite a lot because it was much, the university was very much smaller in those days. Um, and so a handful of people could make a lot of noise and, and make their presence felt. I went away for a very long time. I wasn't at UQ for, oh, 10, years more anyway went away for a long time and a lot of things changed in that time and uh, then over the last 25 years it's continued to change but the university if you like not necessarily at an institutional level but certainly at an interpersonal level mm. and at a uh, in some ways that brings itself out in institutional initiatives and, and so on it's it's always been I've always found it supportive which sounds a bit strange because the institution itself you know, including the, the odd person like I've just mentioned. The institution itself wasn't necessarily geared up to to do it at an institutional level, but it was done in, in informally and, if you like, semi-formally um, pretty well for a long time because there's a lot of, generally speaking, there's a lot of goodwill and support amongst the wider university population. And without that, we, we just couldn't function. Um, uh, at all, we would we would still be you know a handful of people in a in a back room down the back of the campus somewhere. Um, so there's always been you know, high levels of support. It just hasn't been borne out in something as institutionally powerful as the rap. Mm. And you know, but that's Australian society as a whole. When you travel interstate or overseas, mm. do you still bump into a student that you've taught? Yeah, over all, the years? <laughs> ah, all the time. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. Um, uh, yeah, and and the ones that strike me most are either Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who, who, and the, the numbers are still very small. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander number of people, people, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people who do the major is still comparatively small. It used to be virtually none because they'd sort of say, "Why do we need to know about you know be taught at university about ourselves?" kind of thing, and. It was somebody from Torres Strait came in and sat through one of my lectures and, and, and in the end, you know, I saw her many years later and she said, you know, I was very dubious about you know, doing that class and blah, blah, blah. 
you know. But you actually knew what you were talking about. <laughs> it actually all panned out well. Although, well, that was a nice thing to say. Um, uh, but it's also the whitefellas that you get you know, years later, and, and so he'll be some, you know, I don't know, mining engineer that randomly sat in on a course that changed its life. And I remember when I went up for promotion once, I absolutely, without this wasn't organised, but luckily, just before I went up for promotion to full professor, this guy wrote to me from Indonesia or somewhere and said, do you remember me? I'm blogs. I sat in your class, you know, and whatever it was. And he didn't quite say it changed my life, but he said through my whole career as a mining engineer in all the weird parts of the world that mining engineers go, the lessons that you guys taught us in the unit and in that course in particular have stayed with me and have and, you know, helped my career enormously. Mm -hmm. So I sort of stuck that on my on my promotion documents. <laughs> and, but and I thought, well, you know, if only one in, well, not more than one in a hundred, but one in a number, every come and say that, you know, I'm pleased with the job that we've done, both for Aboriginal Shadow Island on people, but the, our, re, the requirement, there was a formal, formal requirement for a long time that we provided education about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island issues to the wider university community. And you know, that, that's been the, one of the most pleasing things. Yeah. And finally, uh, what direction would you like to see the access unit go? It's, a, it's hard to tell because the uni university sector in general and the University of Queensland in particular as a GO8 university and, and so on, have very difficult constraints placed on them by government and the wider kind of social and political economic circumstances that we, we all live in. And, and you know, far be it for me to say, oh, the university and the unit should do these sorts of things. I think with the RAP coming on stream formally, that will make an enormous difference. And I think the way that the university puts the wrap into action, which we've already sort of started, we've got things going on around the university that I'm involved with and other people from the unit are involved with, that will see the wrap being put into action. Um, how the details go on that will you know, vary with whatever area, whether it's teaching or learning or student support or teaching or research rather or student support um, and it's ultimately up to, to the PVC and, and people further up the pile. But I think the university is now heading in the right direction with the RAP and how that plays out, not just because it forces people to do things, but actually brings resources to bear in a way that w was often not the case. I think you know, it, wherever it goes, it's going in the right direction and, and, and will go in good shape.